this is, um, we have, as I mentioned before, uh, the, that the competency-based model is based on having a learning record store. And the, 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 system, the technology system is fundamentally military. It was created out of something called the Advanced Distributed Learning uh, Consortium that was uh, signed in by executive order by Bill Clinton, uh, 13111, and in the mid-1990s. And it was used for distance learning in the military, and then for government, and then for everyone. And so essentially it breaks education down into these uh, noun verb object statements. So it's very narrow, this idea of education that you could just put it in a, like three boxes and they say, we can track it. We can, learning happens everywhere and we can track it. We can track you and we can upload your competency, your badge into this learning locker. So this, this screen share here is an image of what the learning analytic system looks like. Originally, it was something called SCORM, the Shareable Content Object Reference Module, um, and that was screen-based learning, and that was things like, you know, Dreambox and online learning on Chromebooks and tablets, maybe not even tablets, but the XAPI technology allowed uh, data to be aggregated across wearable technology and mobile learning, including phones, and so these were all developed um, out of problem solutions as a defense contractor for the military. And so we have to understand that this competency-based model and the infrastructure of getting skills badges and putting them in learning record stores is a fundamentally military construct. And then if we can maybe advance to the, I guess the learning ecosystem disappeared. Um, okay, yeah, I don't know why these, Images aren't showing up. Um, so the, the next one is the robots. Again, this is from a company called Tell Existence. It's out of Tokyo. Again, the, this Japan, uh, you know, the, the haptic robotics, you can see the, the guy with the VR headset and the hand controllers. They were using the, the, these robots to stock shelves in convenience stores. That's their initial product use that they were talking about. In one of the videos, it's like a poor guy sitting in a dark closet. You know, the guy is in the closet and the robot is in the convenience store loading up the refrigerator case. It's very grim. So, um, so, you know, I don't think we want this future. I don't think that, that we want to be like competing for skills badges to so that we can, you know, live up through our robots. But this is literally the paper next to it is from the United Nations in 2019 called Globotics and Development. Globotics. Look up, look that up, Globotics or Globalization 4.0, uh, this Richard Baldwin. And then this is an excerpt from this paper that they're advancing this not as a bad thing. They say, as various forms of virtual presence technology are combined with human controlled robots, an expanding range of manual services could be provided at a distance. At the high end, technicians could conduct inspections or undertake repairs from remote locations. And nurses in the Philippines could care for the elderly in Japan. And at the low end, hotel rooms in Oslo could be cleaned by robots controlled by cleaners in Kenya and lawns in Texas could be maintained by robots steered by Mexican gardeners sitting in Mexico. Exactly. And so the thing is with geofencing that is coming under the biosecurity state and these wearable technologies, you can geofence anybody anywhere. And this is what I'm trying to get through to people who are working on issues of immigration and border security and social justice around that is that immigrant like border control is going to be something that will affect all of us in the in this near future especially if their goal is to have us trapped in small physical footprints whether smart cities smart buildings and to have the robots out in the world doing the work right and so even people on the conservative side who I think feel like if we could control our borders we might have a protectionist strategy to protect our laborers in this world, that doesn't matter, right? If you are not taking into account, account telepresence labor, controlling your borders doesn't matter. And that is why I feel like there is this profound opportunity to look at this from the standpoint of global solidarity, because none of us want to compete with people all over the world for the lowest wage to do this sort of terrible work. And then I will say, like, I think there's one last slide. Can you get the last one? Oh, oh, it's going to data zone. 
Oh, okay. Wow. It's, it's clicking around in different ways. Okay. So the data zone ultimately to do the AI, uh, 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 assignment of labor and the tracking of your human capital, they need a digital identity system data zone, which is based in San Jose schools is the template. Uh, it is tracking your cognitive data, uh, early childhood, foster care, judicial involvement, mental health, all of this data is feeding together. And then it's, it's expanding into something called the Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust and this National Interoperability Collaborative. But the idea of reducing children to a QR code, I first saw in the use of Clever, which is an interoperable data system that was used for online learning in kindergartners because they couldn't remember their passwords. And this was in Rocket Ship Academy charter schools in California. So they were re reducing these children to a QR code that they could decorate with stickers in order to create an interoperable data profile of them. And you can see in the image, there's this young girl who's actually turned into a cartoon character in the picture, like her arm as it um, um, enters into the screen and the QR code turns into a cartoon. And then below that is the daily pass out of Los Angeles that we're seeing with uh, COVID testing is again, reducing children's uh, medical status to a QR code to this data code because the pay for success finance is intimately linked to interoperable data for the predictive analytics. And again, that feeds into this, this yellow box where they talk about the people there. This is from Global Education Futures Forum. The website is now taken offline, uh, but it was uh, steered by Pavel Luksha, who is a transhumanist out of Skolkovo in Russia, but he worked very closely with Tom Vander Ark here in the United States. And they have a map of their, their projected forecast of education through 2035. And this is one of the items that you that there, there will be people who will have fortunes made up of human beings that are built of human capital. So, you know, we have to take this very seriously. And I, I think, is that the, is that the end? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I, I do things, well, you know, I have a lot to say, <laughs> but I appreciate the time. I know we were only gonna do an hour and this ended up longer, so. <laughs> we're learning. <laughs> That would be great. I mean, I think the best we can do is uh, open up space for conversation and dialogue, right? And to say there are there's a profound power imbalance in the moment, right? That, and many systems, both civic systems and governmental systems, seem to be not as responsive as they should be to local people, and to have have imbalance of information of who has what information. And so if we can claw that back and actually start to have the conversations of what, what are the futures we want for our children, that's, that's the consensus we need. And then you back end it in, how do we get there?